Hello and welcome to the special ACM Learning web Webinar. You are one of over 3,600 individuals who signed up for today's webinar. This webcast reflects ACM's deep commitment to lifelong learning. Our aim is to empower computing professionals and students who join ACM's worldwide community, over 100,000 members. My name is Will Trace. I'm a Lockheed Martin Farrell Emeritus, and currently I serve as chair of the ACM Special Interest Group on Software Engineering. Also, I'm a member of the ACM Professional Development Committee. Thanks. I'm just trying to get the slide here going. Okay, ACM offers innovative educational professional development resources that bolster skill sets and enhance career development opportunities. Our members are able to stay competitive in a dynamic world with a range of ACM Learning Center online resources at learning.acm.org. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. ACM recognizes the role of computing in driving the innovations that sustain competitiveness in a global environment. Together with timely computer information published by ACM, access to the ACM Digital Library, the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature, and international conferences that draw leading experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics. ACM enables its members to solve critical problems using new technology that enriches our lives and advances our society in the digital age. Now for some housekeeping items. As usual, at the end of the presentation, we'll have time for questions and answers. In the top right corner of the slide area of your screen, there is a button that will allow you to enlarge the slides. You may also enlarge the slides at any time by dragging the corner of the slide window. The slides will advance automatically through the event. You can minimize the slide area, Q&A, and bio screens using the buttons at the bottom of the panel. You can also use a number of widgets that are found on the bottom panel as you mouse over, including Facebook, Twitter, a sharing tool, and the resource list where you can get a copy of the slides. Again, use the resource list to get a copy of the slides. If you are experiencing any problems with the program, please press F5 key on your keyboard if you're using Windows or Command R if you are on a Mac to refresh your console or close and relaunch the presentation. You can also visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the help widget below the slide window. At the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey URL on the final slide. Please take a minute to fill it out and help us improve your next webinar experience. This session is being recorded and will be archived. If uh, you can't uh, catch to all of today or you want to pass it on to others, it will be available for review in the next few days at learning.acm.org. So if you think of any question during the presentation, please type it into the Q&A box and click on the Submit button. You don't need to wait until the end of the presentation to begin submitting questions, and you can also use the QA box uh, and the survey at the end of today's webinar to suggest topics for future webinars of interest to you. As a recent addition to our webinar series, you can now use Facebook and Twitter widgets at the bottom panel to share the presentation link with your friends as well as tweet comments and questions using the hashtag tag, pound sign ACM webinar Lally. Today's presentation is IBM Watson Beyond Jeopardy by Adam Lally. Adam is a senior technical staff member in the Watson Technologies Department of IBM's TJ Watson Research Center. He's an experienced system architect and software developer. As an original member of the Deep QA project, he helped develop the Watson system architecture that gave the machine its speed. He also worked on the natural language processing algorithms that enable Watson to understand questions and categories and gather and assess evidence in natural language. Before working on Watson, he was the lead software engineer for the Unstructured Information Management Architecture Project an open source platform for creating, integrating, and deploying unstructured information management solutions. Adam, we look forward to your presentation today. Okay, thank you, Will. 
Um, so I'm going to uh, talk today about the IBM Watson system, um, how it works, how we uh, achieved our success at the Jeopardy Challenge, and then go on to say what kinds of things we're doing these days with that technology. So, sorry, I'm going the wrong direction here. <laughs> I have to go forward. Okay, here we go. So first, I want to talk about um, what we are um, what, what we talk about when we meet a grand challenge. So a lot of research that happens both in IBM and elsewhere is all these incremental improvements that are just moving the state of the art forward a little bit, and that's really important and that adds up over time. But sometimes um, we want to try to do something that's uh, a bigger step forward from where we are today. And one of the examples of that was the Deep Blue computer that defeated the chess grandmaster world champion uh, Gary Kasparov in the 90s. And you know this sort of captures the imagination. The, the public, public becomes aware of what we're doing, and the computers computing is making big strides. Also engages the scientific community about you know what kinds of things are possible. And also, though IBM, you know we're an industrial research center here, um, and we need to be relevant to IBM customers. And you know the, the the chess computer was you know we had better computing power and that was applicable to a lot of scientific computing applications, but as you'll see with the Jeopardy application with processing unstructured language, this has tons of applications to different areas listed here. And in, in particular, we are focusing a lot on healthcare, where there is so much unstructured text out there that you know doctors and medical professionals cannot keep up with that they would like help from technology for. Um, so I drew this parallel to the chess problem, but I want to point out that this is a very different and very uh, much more difficult problem to, to solve Jeopardy than it was to solve chess. So chess is finite and it's mathematically well-defined. There's only a small number of rules in chess. Um, there's a limited number of moves and states. Now, I mean, there's, there's a very huge number of, of possible games, of course, you know, more than you can possibly sort of solve. But Still, it's clear what your possible moves are at any point and what will happen if you take those moves and you can you can sort of plan ahead that way. It's very explicit. Human language is ambiguous. It it's, depends on the context. You know, word, what a word means depends on the context. It's it's grounded only ultimately in, in human cognition. You know, what thoughts, you know, what what, um, what the meaning is of a word. It only depends on what a human thinks it means. And a real problem for computers is that there's a seemingly infinite number of ways of expressing the same meaning, right? So if someone asks you a question in English, you can't just go and search those exact words in an encyclopedia and expect to find the answer because it may be said there in different words, and that's really a huge problem. The, the Jeopardy challenge we really thought was a great problem to drive this problem of, of unstructured information understanding and, and question answering um, along sort of these five key dimensions. And so one is that there, it, it's a broad and open domain problem. You, you can look at, you can read the example for Jeopardy clues here, and they're on four diff very different topics, right? You have something about the construction of a house, you have a literature question, a biology question, a question about geography and global diplomacy. And what this really means is, you know, a lot of people thought we built Watson by sitting down and entering facts into a big database. And you really can't do that because it's not a limited domain. You'd be so you'd be entering facts into a database forever if you wanted to encode all of the knowledge needed to answer Jeopardy questions. So it's not feasible. And even if you could, if someone hands you to this database, you'd have to say the next problem, which is complex language. You know, these aren't structured, templated queries where I know you're going to ask me who is the president of X, where you fill in the country. I can just do a SQL query and look it up in the database, right? The questions come in any in any kind of English language. It's open, you know, fair game. Anything you can say in English, you can ask. So even if I had a database, how would I even phrase a structured query to look it up? And that requires a great deal of, of language processing. Um, now, the, the other dimensions are that you need very high precision to succeed at the Jeopardy game. Um, if you get a question wrong, you lose that dollar value, so you can't be guessing. And you need an accurate confidence for the same reason. You have to know when you are likely to have the right answer and when you're not. So you know when to try to buzz in to answer the question and when to hold back. Uh, something this is something that um, computers traditionally struggle with. You think of a search engine, you enter a query, it's always going to come back with something. It never really comes back and says, I don't know, or I didn't understand. Um, and that's really what we're challenged to do in this scenario. And it's useful for a lot of applications. You don't want guesswork from your computer. And then finally, high speed. In order to be successful, we figured you had to be able to answer these questions in an average of about three seconds. 
the first person to buzz in at the game uh, in the game wins control and, and the opportunity to the opportunity to answer the question. So this is a chart we use to uh, track our performance. I'm going to use it again um, later, so it's useful to describe um, what how what it means. So each of the dots, sort of the top center of this of this chart, is the result of an actual Jeopardy game. So it's the performance of a winner of an actual historical Jeopardy game. The x-axis is the number, the percentage of questions that that person was confident enough in their answer and fast enough on the buzzer to have an opportunity to answer. And there, there are three contestants in the game, so like if they were all equally um, capable, it would be one-third. So the winners are answering far more than their fair share. And then the y-axis is the precision. So of the questions they answered, what percentage did they get right? And so humans are very, very good. They, they usually know when they are right and when they're wrong about 90% of the time. The red dots are Ken Jennings, who's this great Jeopardy champion who won 50-something um, games in a row, and so that's why he has so many points on the graph. And uh, you can see he's getting about the, ch the chance to answer about two-thirds of the questions, which is quite amazing. So that's what we're up against. And our system in 2007, which is a system we've been working on, not on Jeopardy, but on other much simpler questions, um, we just turned it unmodified onto the Jeopardy problem, and we got this performance down at the bottom of the graph in this brown line. And there's a sort of curve here, and what this means is, if you look at the extreme left end, if we ask the computer only to answer, say, the 5% of the questions it was most confident in, it would get only 45% of them right. And as it answered more that it was less confident, it would get more and more wrong. And then if, if you try to answer all of the questions, it was getting, say, about 15% or something. So basically nowhere near good enough. And what we so what we decided to do sorry I'm, I'm what we decided to do is decided to do is build a whole new system. But before I I get there, um, I'm going to use this example of a Jeopardy question. And I thought we'd stop here and actually ask this of the audience. So in 1698, this comet discoverer took a ship called the Paramore Pink on the first purely scientific sea voyage. So if you submit your answer, and remember you only get in Jeopardy you already have run out of time because you only get three seconds. Really, someone would have buzzed in already. But we'll give you uh, a few more seconds. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move on, and um, we'll, we'll come back to the answers at the end, what the audience put in. But I'm gonna talk about how Watson solved this question. Okay, so so how does Watson work? So I'm going to walk through this example. So the first thing we do is analyze the question, and we analyze it in lots of different ways, which is it's difficult to really get into all the details of natural language processing here. Um, but I'm going to give you a, kind of a sense. You know, one thing, simple thing, is you extract important terms. So 1698 is important, comet, paramore, pink. But we don't really stop there. So what we have to figure out, one very important thing is what's the answer type? What kind of thing are they asking for? In this case, comet discoverer. Now, we don't have a list of comet discoverers in Watson. Again, how could you anticipate that they were going to ask you about that. Um, but we can try to make use of this later once we know what it is we're looking for. So it's very important to get that right. Uh, we also find types of entities. So we know 1698 is a date, so we can do some, some kind of date-specific processing with that. And then relations that relate different words in the clue to other words in the clue. So the discoverer took a ship. The ship's called the Paramore Pink. Um, so being able to build a, a model of the question like that is very important. And again, this is just like a sampling of the kinds of things that we do, ranging from very shallow to very deep um, techniques. So next we do what we call primary search. And sometimes people ask, well, can't um, web search do Jeopardy already? Well, can, in a way, it does this step only and not the rest of the steps. So primary search is you go out against your content sources. This is mainly unstructured text. Now, we did have some structured knowledge that we acquired and used in Watson when it fit the question. Um, but by and large, because the questions are so open, we, you need to go against unstructured text like encyclopedias, news articles, um, other you know, reference material, all kinds of text that we obtained and fed into Watson. So it's searching against that, try to find um, documents and passages relevant to that question. But once you get that, you can't hand in a document or even a, a sentence as, a, um, as an answer to a question, right? You have to answer the question exactly, and that's where web search is is fell short, right? So 
So the next thing we do is we extract candidate answers from these documents and passages and other sources that we've pulled back. And we cast a very wide net here. It, Watson doesn't have like one really precise algorithm to just go in, understand the text, and pull out the answer. As you'll see, it's, it's much more complicated than that and lots more parts. So the first thing we do is try to find possibilities, and then we'll analyze them more further. So we pull out all kinds of things. We might pull out Isaac Newton. You know, he was very active in 1698. He's scientific, so it's relevant to the clue. Wilhelm Temple, no one's ever heard of, but he turns out he discovered a lot of comets. Uh, we get HMS Paramore, which is the official name of the ship. Now, at this point, no, we don't even really know. We're not just pulling back scientists. We don't really know yet necessarily um, who is a comet discoverer, who's not. It might be difficult even for a computer to know, is HMS Paramore a person? You know, that, this is not trivial stuff in general in all cases. So we're casting a very wide net, pulling back lots of possibilities. Um, you'll see that as we, we generate hundreds of these, and some of the ones towards the bottom are very bad. And you see the very bottom of this, this list are some examples. Um, there, there are this, this question they used on a Nova special about Watson to make fun of us. That original system with that brown line, um, it, it, it pulled back a document. It, it, found, it focused in on Paramore Pink, and it found a document in its set of documents that was a script for the Pink Panther movie. So it had pink in the title and described a, a, a character as being a Paramore, so I thought this was really irrelevant. And then it knew it needed to answer with a person, and so the most prominent person was Peter Sellers, who's the star of the Pink Panther movies. And so it answered with Peter Sellers, and this was really funny but stupid and sad. And so we aim to improve on that, and, and we have. So, so how do you do that? We have many candidate answers. Most of them are wrong. Most of them are very wrong. Um, what we do is do more search. We, we pull back evidence, textual evidence, relevant to these candidates and the terms in the clue. And then we analyze that evidence with many different algorithms. So we don't, again, we don't have one precise way of telling which passages are good, which passages of text are bad. We have a hundred of different ways of doing this. To give you a sense, I've kind of organized them into these, you know, I can't put a hundred numbers here, but different kinds of algorithms um, that, that look at this. And the numbers are kind of made up, but sort of to give you a sense here. So term overlap, I mean, um, do, do these, the terms in the question co-occur with these answers? It's a very shallow thing. Classification, is this the right type of thing? So is this a comet discoverer? Um, and we might not be sure. You know, these numbers could be not zero or one. We actually have many different algorithms that try to do this typing um, of the answer. Relations are, you know, is the like took discoverer ship or a ship called Paramore Pink? Do these match? So is there any evidence this person took a ship? And better if the ship was called the Paramore Pink. Uh, temporal evidence is very important when the date is a date in the clue. So one reason that one of many reasons why Peter Sellers is a bad answer to this question is that he was not alive in 1698. Um, so we can try to score that. Now we have many of these numbers. Now we have a whole vector of numbers basically associated with each answer, seeing how our algorithms did. And they don't agree. So how do we figure out what the right answer is? This is where machine learning comes in. So we have many historical Jeopardy clues with known correct answers. So we can run these through Watson and produce these, this big matrix of numbers. And then machine learning will basically tell you how you weight your different algorithms to, so that on the known correct answers, you tend to get good scores and on the historical questions. So it finds ways to combine the algorithms. And then you can use those on unseen questions, and we can get the correct answer, Edmund Halley, in, um, with high confidence and that Peter Sellers has low confidence. So one of the nice things about this, uh, this algorithm is it's massively parallelizable. So every... Um, primary search result we can analyze in parallel to generate candidates so on a different node in a big compute cluster. And then each candidate answer, we can retrieve evidence in parallel, and each piece of evidence we can run our algorithms over in parallel. So we can take advantage of this, this you know, rack of powerful computers to do all this processing all at the same time and answer a question in, in three seconds on average, which is critical for being able to play the game. Um, I'm going to skip. Skip this slide. I think it was supposed to be hidden. Okay, so um, now we have an architecture. This is a very busy slide. I'm going to sort of rush through this. We have, we have an architecture, but that doesn't mean we have a system that works. So we started with only, say, six algorithms, not hundreds, back in uh, you know, 2007, 2008, and we didn't get a good enough accuracy, as you'll see. So what do we do now? So this sort of describes the process starting at the top left and going kind of clockwise. You know, we, you build a version of the system that has a certain set of algorithms and, and content in it, and you train it on your known Jeopardy questions, and you run it on unseen test questions, or questions you did not, did not train on, and you look at how well you're doing. 
Now, um, there's a, a state called expert annotation here. Now, in, in Jeopardy, it's kind of easy for anyone to judge whether their answer is right or wrong. But if you think of another domain like medicine, it's not so easy um, to say whether the computer's answer to a diagnosis question, say, is right or wrong. You might actually need domain experts to help you. So once you sort of know how, how you're doing on a particular set of questions, now we do what's called accuracy analysis. You look at the ones you're getting wrong um, and you try to figure out, come up with ideas for what to do about it. This leads into uh, algorithm development and you kind of iterate, you work on an idea for an algorithm, you work on it for a while until you achieve positive impact on your test set and then you put it into the system and you just run this loop over and over again, um, gradually improving. And that leads us to this next slide, which is that, um, and my screen not showing up very well. Okay, there it is. So, so what's going on here is that again that chart that I showed before about our performance and how we steadily improved it over time. So in the first year, we we made a huge progress to where that orange line is. This was getting this architecture that I described in place and doing the first few obvious algorithms. In the next five months or so, we moved up to the next bright green line where we we added a whole bunch more algorithms that were suggested by looking at our failures. And then it gets harder because you've done the easy stuff. Um, but by just sort of cranking through this process, we were able to steadily move up until we had a system that was performing at the level that crosses through that, what we call the winner's cloud, where the, you know, where Ken Jennings' performance is. Uh, one of the things I want to point out is that there's a lot of natural language processing technology. I went too fast. Um, behind, a lot of natural language processing technology behind this about how all this works. It's, it, I don't have a whole lot of time to go into details, um, but I wanted to point out that, that a lot of the people on our team are working on this, and we've achieved, we've achieved a lot of great progress on these individual component technologies that uh, I've quoted some results here. So um, processing questions, being able to sort of parse them and, you know, what are the nouns and verbs and what are the subjects and objects of the verbs, we were achieving, you know, over – 92% uh, accuracy or so, um, which was much better than when we started. We have this this problem at the top right of, of mapping text. So you get a text like um, Lenin Shipyard, and you have a knowledge base of entities, and you want to know what that means. It maps to something. Maybe it maps to Gdansk Shipyard. It's an alternative name for that. So being able to resolve entities, some are ambiguous, like Northern Shipyard could mean different things. Um, being able to resolve an entity to, to what it refers to in ontology, is a, a problem that we worked on and we achieved a very high performance on that. Relation extraction and passage matching or in the bottom are, are, are tasks that a lot of people at NLP have worked on. And we, on both of those, we sort of on shared tasks that other people were competing on, we had the best result when we, we took our thing we had built for Jeopardy and ran it on that shared task and we came out with a leading score. Um, against other people that were, were competing in the same space. So there's a lot of underlying work in NLP going on here and, um, and making a lot of progress that sort of drives this. Now, um, you know, this is the sort of overall system that when we ran it on a single core, it took almost two hours to answer a question that would make for a very boring Jeopardy game. So we scaled it out over 280 cores. And because it's so parallel, um, this the algorithm is parallel, it works very well. and we can get the time down to a reasonable amount of time to actually play the game. So now we're ready to play the uh, Jeopardy game. So a quick question, you can submit um, whether you watched the Watson episode of Jeopardy. Okay, and then we'll look at the uh, results. So a little bit over half of you uh, watched the, the Jeopardy episode, so great. And um, you know, those of you who didn't probably, oh, sorry, I didn't get pushed to the audience. So yeah, so 54% say they watched the Jeopardy episode. So um, those of you who didn't um, may have seen the victory picture, but if not, this is what um, it looked like at the end. So with the right precision and accurate confidence and speed, uh, we were able to defeat Ken, Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter, the two all-time Jeopardy champions. So we were all very happy with that result. Um, there was one little thing that you may have heard of that went, that we got widely reported that Watson did poorly on, which I'll talk a little bit about. But first, uh, I'm going to ask the audience this question. Um, you probably, those of you who watched the episode or heard about it, know the relevance of this. But if you don't, then you will um, 
we will soon. Watson had a little trouble basically on the, the question related to this. Okay, so you want to push push the results. Okay, so most people say it's in Canada. Um, that is, of course, the most obvious answer. The the t technically the answer to this question is that there are places called Toronto in all four of those countries. There actually are many towns, several towns called um, Toronto in the United States, um, even one city in Ohio. Um, so you know, obviously the the biggest one is the one in Canada, but. This is tricky, right? I mean, it's tricky if you look for um, evidence that Toronto is a city in the U.S., you might find some. And so here's the question. This is the final Jeopardy question at, at the beginning of the first, at the end of the first Jeopardy game that was played. Its largest airport is named for a World War II hero. Its second largest for a World War II battle, and the category was U.S. cities. And Watson's top answer was Toronto. Um, and this was embarrassing and widely reported. Uh, because Toronto is not a U.S. city, at least the Toronto everyone thinks of. So why? Why the correct answer is Chicago. So, so why is this? Um, you know, it's, it's it's a bunch of different reasons. One is that, the, you know, the way that Watson tries to gather evidence for things. If you try to find evidence for Toronto being a U.S. city, you find some. Now you find a lot more for it for it being Canadian, and you find a lot more evidence for Chicago being a U.S. city. So if you look at like the, this bar chart I'm trying to show that, as you look at the blue bar for Toronto and the, the red bar for Chicago, Watson knows Chicago is a lot more likely to be a U.S. city than Toronto is. But it's also trying to answer the rest of this question, which is it's, it's a hard question. Um, you, you have to kind of maybe ideally find the airport and then try to figure out if it's related to World War II. And it turns out, you know, we looked into this, you know, the, the Toronto's largest airport is Pearson. Um, this is, Pearson was a Canadian prime minister who served in World War I, um, but he was a diplomat during World War II, and there's a lot of things relating him to World War II. So, you know, it's, it's, he's not a World War II hero, but it's kind of related. And its second largest airport was used as a training facility during World War II. So, you know, this is, Watson doesn't clearly understand everything that's going on. It's a hard question, and, and it didn't, for whatever reason, find as much evidence about Chicago's airports. And so it's slightly thinks it's more likely that Chicago is uh, sorry that Toronto is relevant to this quest, the uh, question about the World War II airports. Overall, the competence is very low, right? So 14%. Watson would never have buzzed in to try to answer this question during a game. Uh, it knows it, it doesn't really have a clue. But in the way the game works for these Final Jeopardy questions, there's nothing to be lost, you know, in terms of your chances of winning the game by guessing. Um, this makes you look bad, maybe. Uh, we tried to add lots of question marks after it to make sure Watson looked like he was unsure, and that kind of worked. Um, so anyway, this is some of the, some of the tricky stuff. Another thing is that the 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 category is U.S. cities. It doesn't actually say in the clue text that it's a U.S. city. And sometimes the category can be something that's not the answer type, so the question can be about a U.S. city. So it's a little bit unreliable. It turns out, you know. We do use it, obviously, but um, it turns out that we actually rephrased the question to put U.S. City in the question, and then we would have gotten the question correct, although not by much. So maybe that will give a little more insight about what, what happened there. Okay, so now is a good time to point out that this was not my personal accomplishment. There was a big team here. It started about 12 people, and um, over the four years it grew to about 30. Um, and there's a picture of them here. Um, posing at the Jeopardy set uh, that they constructed in our research lab um, to play this game. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about um, now what we're doing next. So, you know, playing, winning Jeopardy was a great achievement, but where's the real value here for, of this technology? And really it's about providing deeper insight into large volumes of unstructured content. So you think about two kinds of data, unstructured and structured. Unstructured, I mean mainly natural language text, but also audio and video. And there's a lot more of this than there is structured data like relational databases. And the problem is that for computers, it's a lot harder to make any kind of precise uh, conclusions from all this unstructured text. It's very hard to determine what it means. Structured data, it's obvious what it means. You know, if I access the employee ID field of my employee record, I know what I'm going to get uh, because someone specifically encoded that and, and entered the data, but it's very high cost to build and maintain. It's very brittle, meaning that if I try to do something even slightly outside of what the creator of the database uh, intended, I can't. Uh, it doesn't gracefully 
degrade the way that um, unstructured data does. So if I have something that's a little bit similar, maybe I'll get some kind of a, uh, an answer back. So what we want to do with Watson is basically improve the precision of dealing with unstructured text so we can get deeper understanding of all this data that's out there uh, at much lower cost than if we were trying to structure everything into a database. In order to, to, to do that, we really have to advance what we did in, in calling several key dimensions. So one is we, we know specific questions are what we answered with Watson. You can turn them into medical questions like here. Um, but ultimately, this isn't, a doctor's not going to phrase questions like this. Um, and instead, we say that sometimes there's only two questions in medicine. What's wrong with me and how do I fix it? But attached to those questions is really your entire medical record. So being able to deal with all that personalized data is a challenge. Um, question in, answer out. In, in Jeopardy, that's how it worked. You know, you didn't have any opportunity to ask Alex Trebek for clarification or to engage him in a dialogue. The game doesn't work like that. But in a real application, maybe that's the best way to build the application is to have a two-way dialogue with the user. Um, furthermore, you have to explain your answers. Again, in Jeopardy, no opportunity to explain anything. You give your answer and you're right or you're wrong. But real applications, the user doesn't want to trust the computer. It wants to see why did you come up with that answer. And we have that evidence you know, that's how the Watson algorithm works. It pulled back passages of text that, that supported the answer, and so we can show those to the user. And then finally, we need to improve the learning from something that learns offline in our lab, we trained it to be better, to something that actually improves while it's interacting with the user. So that the user says it doesn't, he doesn't like something that Watson said, Watson can learn right there on the spot. Uh, one of the, the, I'll talk about how we adapt, we're trying to work on adapting Watson to the medical domain. The first thing we did was we found these questions, which you can read. This is uh, something published by the American College of Physicians that they call a doctor's dilemma. It's a competition, a little competition for radical residents. And these are like Jeopardy, they look like Jeopardy questions, but they're medical content. So it seems like the most obvious thing. We can just run Jeopardy, one Watson as is on these. Uh, turns out there's a lot of challenges in the language here that uh, we didn't necessarily have perfect solutions for. There's a lot of causation in medicine, you know, what things cause what other things in the body. There's domain-specific terminology you have to deal with. You have to understand what all these medical terms mean. Chronology is very important, what things happen before other things. Negation, you know, a non-productive cough is the opposite of a productive cough. Um, about negation, we often say in Jeopardy, no one goes around saying, you know, if the question asks who's the 16th president of the United States, no one says, George Washington is not the 16th president of the United States, right? No one goes around stating things that aren't true. And so you don't have to be great at weeding that out. But in medicine, this happens a lot. There's a lot of medical texts that say this disease does not cause a certain symptom because that might be very important for diagnosing it as opposed to some other disease. So we need to improve our ability to handle these, these areas. This is that same graph I showed before. Watson well, out of the box on the, um, the medical Jeopardy questions did relatively poorly, uh, that bottom line. We improve things by adding more content, so medical sources um, helped a lot, as opposed to just, you know, what happened, whatever happened to be in, say, Wikipedia, we added, you know, medical textbooks. Um, we also trained on Jeopardy questions. Remember, Watson has this machine learning piece that you need questions and known correct answers to train it with. So providing actual medical questions helped a lot. But then it was just the rest of this, the methodology-driven algorithm adaptation is researchers working on the problem, improving our ability to deal with these, these new challenges. And that, again, worked, and we're sort of driving our performance up on that task. Ultimately, though, these questions, again, aren't realistic. And the next step is these, these are basically pra practice questions for the U.S. medical licensing exam where you really get, you get like a paragraph of text, a little summary of a patient. So not a whole patient record yet, we'll get there. But for now, a summary of a patient having lab values and all kinds of things like that. And then a question, um, which should be a diagnosis question or a treatment question or a question about what's going on in their anatomy. And um, so now we're, we're tending to work on these questions. One of the problems with these or challenges with these is that the answers are not one step away. So this is what an example of what a medical student did with one of these questions that we showed them to. So this slide kind of works from the bottom up. So the bottom is the things we extracted from the record. We have their hemoglobin concentration, which say we know is low. They don't tell you that. You have to figure that out. We have results of their blood smear. We know they have renal failure. And 
So what the medical student basically said is, well, from the hemoglobin concentration, I know they have anemia. From the combination of anemia with normocytic cells, that, that's called normocytic anemia. And then I know that um, if you have renal failure, you might be at risk for a deficiency in things produced by the kidneys, like erythropoietin. And I know that um, erythropoietin is the cause of normocytic anemia. So therefore, with all this evidence, I can conclude that the patient probably has erythropoietin deficiency. So it, it's multiple steps. So that's uh, a big challenge. Now, it's not a new, completely new challenge in Jeopardy. Some Jeopardy questions are like this. On the next slide, I have an example, um, which I will ask you again to try to submit your answer to. On hearing the discovery of George Mallory's body, he told reporters he still thinks he was first. And remember, you only have a few seconds to answer this question if you're playing a Jeopardy game. Really, you have to know the answer by the time I finish reading it when you're playing the Jeopardy game. <laughs> okay, so we'll come back and review the audience answers at the end. But here's the, you know, really the answer here. So George Mallory um, tells you what's related to George Mallory. You know, one of the prominent things is Mount Everest. This is what I mean by a missing link. It's something, it's an intermediate step. Most people, when answering this question, they, fit, they, they have to make this intermediate step to come up with Mount Everest. And now combining Mount Everest with, you know, thinking he was first, you come up with the correct answer, which is Edmund Hillary he was the first person to climb Mount Everest, or at least to survive. Um, I guess there's some, the question is indicating there's some debate about whether George Mallory was indeed first. So in medicine, here's a medical example where we have a 63-year-old with a resting tremor, in the left hand, unexpressive face, difficulty in walking, continuous movement in the left hand. And one of the things we conclude strongly is that they probably have Parkinson's disease. So this is uh, a strong cause of resting tremor and it's very appropriate for a 63 year old as opposed to a, you know, a, a teenager or something which might have another different cause for the tremor. Uh, the question ultimately asked, as you look at the very bottom of that text box, what part of his nervous system is most likely affected so from Parkinson's disease, we can find that the substantia nigra is the part of the brain that's responsible um, and get this question right. Um, and I just want to show that in each of these links, we can have evidence um, of text that actually supports these conclusions, which again, is, we think is very important to um, a real application. So we call this technology Watson paths, the ability to build these, these paths. So given re ideally eventually real medical scenarios, but for now these pedagogical or educational ones, um, we're gonna basically provide decision support by showing a user what um, possibility, what conclusions can be drawn from the data and let them look at the, the evidence. Those are collaborative, they can look at the evidence, they can help Watson along and they can say, no, this is bad, this is good. Um, and that helps to teach Watson over time to get better uh, at making these decisions. And just a few more slides here, just a little screenshot of a, of a very, very early prototype. So in, this is showing that the, the user can help assist in, in pulling out factors, so resting tremor is very important. Um, now we have to generate hypotheses. Now in these practice, this practice exam questions, multiple choice, they tell you the possibilities. And in a real scenario, physicians though generate possibilities. It's differential diagnosis. They generate po many possible diseases. Not they don't just leap right to the one conclusion. They're taught to generate other possibilities and then sort them out. So this still fits very well. We generate hypotheses, which we show as these green nodes at the, the bottom of the graph, and then we can look at the graphs that show Watson's thinking, basically what things are concluded that link the factors to the input factors in the gray at the top to the candidate answers in green at the bottom, which are things like the Parkinson's disease. And we can view evidence. So why why did we think that? And the user has an opportunity to help here. So here's a, a passage that Watson was only 10% confident in uh, about the, the um, it typifies Parkinson's disease and Watson wasn't really sure whether what typified meant, for example, and and the user can say, well, typified is really the same same thing as in this context as indicate. So this symptom is indicating this disease. So the user has an opportunity to help here, and Watson can get smarter. Um, and this is another way of showing we can drill into the the evidence. We can see the passages of text that Watson pulled back. We can see these bar charts are showing what 
things are most important in terms of that passage supporting this conclusion. So it, the resting tremor is very, very strong evidence here for the Parkinson's disease more so than the 63-year-old, although that's more than some of these other, other terms. And so that's again a very early prototype, and actually even these screenshots are old, and we've moved, we're moving on since then um, to, we have a collaboration with the Cleveland Clinic uh, where we're working with them to try to figure out how we can build this technology into something useful. Okay, and um, so that's it. I, we have a lot of time for questions and answers. Um, a little bit before we get there, I want to point out there's a whole journal of the IBM Journal of Research and Development, a whole issue um, devoted to Watson that our team here spent a lot of time and effort publishing these papers after the contest um, and really trying to put down in writing what what made Watson achieve what it did in all sorts of different different areas. Uh, lots of evaluations about you know how much did each of the things we did actually impact the final system. Um, really proud of that work. So if you're interested in this technical area, definitely look that up. There's an older um, issue on unstructured information management in general, uh, the whole problem of dealing with unstructured text, which is also has some useful stuff, useful foundation stuff. There are links um, here to those in the slides if you download the slides. Also, that first link is something that just came up, which is uh, came out, which is a, um, a position paper basically coming from IBM Research on, on what's happening with artificial intelligence and its relation to the big data, which is another way of saying the large volume of unstructured text that's out there in the world, and um, and how IBM is viewing this impacting. Uh, the world. So, so that's um, that's all I have here, and I think now Will's going to recap the answers to those questions I asked earlier. Well, thank you very much, Adam. And uh, it was hard for me to uh, keep on top of the uh, uh, deluge of questions that are coming in. But first, uh, let's take a look at the daily double, uh, and that was uh, who was the uh, the Explorer, and I'm pleased to say that 90% of the people had it right if we don't factor in spelling. And uh, and that was, we had 124 people actually uh, register that. Now, the second one, unfortunately, less than half of people had it correct, but uh, we did have some humorous answers for those people who uh, uh, so chose to uh, exercise that option. So uh, with that said, it will go for uh, I was looking at the questions, and a lot of them had to do with the implementation. A lot of them had to do with the application, and and some of them had to do with finding out the technology and you know building on the technology. So uh, I will leave those sort of outside uh, the current list, the ones that I floated up here. Um, and so I'll ask some quick questions. Uh, will Watson be part of the IBM Smart City in the future? Um, probably, probably potentially. You know, there's a you know there's a big effort within IBM to, to commercialize this technology in all sorts of different areas. So, um, you know, IBM basically started started up a whole division, the Watson Solutions division, uh, that we spent we here in research spent the better part of a year uh, after you know while we were writing these papers, we were also basically educating uh, other people in other parts of IBM that go out into the world and do these solutions. And so we've transferred a lot of capability to apply this Watson technology to other parts of IBM, and they are now out there doing that and trying to figure out how it applies in all of different um, solution spaces, including the smarter cities stuff. Good. So there's lots of applications. Okay. Here's a, when Watson is listening to a, I think this is a clarification that you need to make. When Watson is listening to a question or text, does it transform the voice? The text in order to do the process. So what you know, we, when in Jeopardy, you, you're you're shown the clue in text, and then the host reads it. So what we did is process the the text that we were we were shown, and the humans are doing this too, right? They're 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 shown the clue and they read they read it ahead of the host. So but it, it turns on that application by waiting. If you're waiting to hear the host read it, you're missing a big opportunity. Um, to get a head start. So it turns out for that application, it wasn't really that important. Now, IBM does have a lot of voice 
to text, speech to text um, capability here in research, and that's being deployed in, in lots of different areas. And definitely real applications of this are considering voice interfaces that would transform the voice to text and then uh, try to answer the question based on the text. Okay, uh, another easy question. And what programming language or languages are algorithms implemented in? So most of Watson is implemented in Java. Um, there, are, however, are some exceptions. So our, the, the parser, which is one of the, the, the core components, basically the first thing that goes first, which you know, is kind of like diagramming sentences. So if you remember your English class, where you get to find the verbs and then figure out what the subjects of the verbs are and the objects and this prepositional phrase modifies what noun and all that kind of thing. That's implemented in C, and it was a, a project that's been going on for you know for decades here in uh, in IBM Research. Um, most of it's in Java. Also, we actually use some Prolog, which uh, I think people find very interested interesting. Um, it's not like all this is all of Watson was doing Prolog proofs, but there it, it, there were parts that were, and it's very useful language for pattern matching where against these parse trees, I'm looking for certain patterns, like I, I, I want to find where um, I have, you know, say, the question's asking who is the author of a certain book, and I, so I can, I can write a pattern that matches that, where I'm looking for um, a verb like, uh, or a role like author, or maybe similar roles like writer and everything, and, and then a, a work of art, right? So I can write a pattern that basically will fire, when it, when it sees that, it'll say, oh, this is author of relationship. And you know, again, we did some of that. You can't do that for every relation that were that exists in the world, and we didn't. But we did some of that, and we actually implemented a lot of that in Prolog. It's just very easy declaratively to say these kind of declare these rules. And Java, it would be right. a lot of uh, lines of code. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, another quick question: Are there any artificial neural networks in Watson? We're actually not using neural networks in the in that technical sense. Um, and for the machine learning, um, we could use, we could really use any kind of machine learning technology in the, that that place where we're trying to determine how to combine all of our different algorithms that it describes. We have many different features associated with an answer, so many different scores, trying to figure out how to combine them. Um, we tried different things. There's, there's just a, a whole slew of possible um, machine learning um, algorithms you can do in addition to neural networks and there's support vector machines. Um, we ended up actually using logistic regression, um, which worked very well for us. But there's lots of opportunities to explore different things there. Um, yeah. Okay, I got a bunch of UIIMA questions. Uh, could you say a little bit about why you used it, how you used it, and how much you used it? Sure. Sure. So it's the foundation for for all of Watson, right? So the, what this this UEMA is, Unstructured Information Management Architecture, is a it's just an open source framework. It's an Apache project now. Um, it was developed here at IBM, um, a large part of it by by me, um, but with others. And it it's a it's a framework. So basically, it doesn't do any. You don't if you download it, it doesn't do any natural language processing. Um, it, but you can plug components into it, so it's, it achieves interoperability between different components. Right? So I have a I have a parser component. I put that in. I have a uh, a date detector component, I put that in, or I have a name identity detector that detects all sorts of classes of entities, I have things that detect relations. So I built this like pipeline of components, and they can be developed by different people, but they're all developed at the same interface, so I can plug them in, I can run them together. Um, and so all of the, the components that, that do the analysis and also that do the scoring, like matching a passage to a question in these hundreds of different ways, they're all UEMA components. And so it achieves interoperability, but another nice thing is it also is useful for scale out. So by having these different components, I can then use the asynchronous scale out capability of UEMA to say, okay, now take these components and deploy, you know, 50 copies of them on these different nodes and send my data across to them, right? So I can take, I've, I've componentized my algorithms into all these different pieces, and now I can declaratively deploy them. I don't have to write code to do this. I just have to say, um, you know. How many instances of each thing I want, and and it it just takes care of the deployment for you, and you can actually you can you can easily scale up and down. So we can run Watson in a single thread, and we we often did that in sort of development and testing, and then we can scale it up to play a game, and it's very convenient for that. Are there any other open source components in Watson? 
Um, well, there are various. I mean, there are lots of various library. You know, libraries. Nothing. Nothing as significant as Uima. But I mean, we we use a, you know Apache libraries and Apache Commons and things like that. I mean, um, you know, we're 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 willing to use that stuff rather than reinvent the wheel. Uh, but nothing, nothing that's uh, as significant. Uh, nothing that's like a natural language processing uh, kind of open source product. We okay. basically did all of that in house. Okay. Well, I, we've now exceeded a hundred questions here. It's very uh, challenging to try to keep on top of the flood that's coming in. How, uh, here's a question. Actually, it's a it's a good non technical question, but I think one everybody will have an appreciation for. How many hours or man years of effort really went into creating uh, the algorithms, or you might say, you know, to make Watson competitive? Well, to do the math, I guess. I mean, you know, it, it was it's a it was a four year project basically from 2007 to 2011, um, and you know, it was 12 full-time people at the beginning growing at some rate up to uh, 40. So I guess if you average that to like 30, um, then you have, uh, what, 30, 120 person years? <laughs> I, you know, I think, um, so a lot. I mean, it was a, it was the kind of thing that, like I said, is, is a, a grand challenge, right? IBM had, the research had to set aside these people and say, we don't need to get anything out of you for four years. Like we didn't publish um, for from almost we published very little for while we were doing this, um, and we weren't rolling out things to be used in products. Um, but they were giving us all the resources we needed, you know, hardware and hiring new people. So it required that level of investment. That it wasn't just this incremental thing. It was a lot of people and a lot of time. Uh, here's the uh, once again this is sort of challenging coming through these questions so uh, Mike what problem was Watson designed to do before you turned it into a Jeopardy problem or was it Jeopardy from the start so the basic, basically we based this on work that we had done before in what's called open domain question answering this is, this is like an academic area uh, a research area and then we had a small team say three people working on this again very usually simpler questions like just being able to answer you know who was the president of this, or you know, what country did, did something uh, was some place in, or what date did something occur? Those kinds of questions. But it, it's you know, it's basically trying to get information out of unstructured text. And so we had a we had a question answering system for these simple questions, and you know, it was moving along incrementally. But at some point, I mean, we were you know, IBM was um, was bouncing around that idea of playing the playing this Jeopardy game as a it's a great way to just drive this forward. Like I mentioned why it's such a great problem with the different different dimensions. You need to have uh, precision, you need to have speed, you need to have broad coverage. So really, you know, we, we, we thought about this, you know, was it reasonable to invest, invest in, and we basically decided we had we had to do this. If we're going to work on question answering, um, we have to take on this challenge. I mean, if you can't do this, then this, is never, this technology is never going to get to the point where it's going to be uh, applicable to real problems. Um, you have to be able to do open domain. You can't be restricting the domain. You have to be able to know when you're right and when you're not, and you have to be able to do it quickly. And this wasn't getting done in our older research until we really had this motivating objective to really say, we're going to try it for this goal and, and get everyone together and excited about it and sort of laser-like focus on this problem. Um, and, and that's how we, how we were doing Jeopardy. That's a great uh, the Watson itself was built for the Watson architecture was built at when we decided we were going to do Jeopardy. We had a QA system, but it was woefully inadequate for Jeopardy, and so Watson was born from that. That's a great answer. Uh, here's a here's what I think is a great question: uh, Is there any opportunities for people, quote unquote, like us, which I will assume actually to leave that open ended, to contribute to Watson? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, we, it's, yeah, there's not, it's not, a, there's not an open way of doing that. I mean, you're, you're sort of, um, we, we are, you know, we have some university collabor collaborators, um, you know, the big one in the news was, um, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, RPI, that, uh, is collaborating with us, um, and, um, and, and things like that, but there isn't a sort of open, 
collaboration, but I mean, discussions are certainly possible um, in any of those areas. So, um, yeah, I know it's probably an unsatisfying answer. <laughs> no, okay, here's the, just as easy a question, uh, tongue in cheek. Do you think Google Now technology will threaten Watson someday, or are there any competition uh, competitors out there for uh, dethroning sort of Watson's uh, in a jeopardy? type head-to-head uh, -head competition? Well, no one's come forward and said that they can do this, right? I think it's actually it's it's amazing, it's kind of telling in some sense that uh, you know, we're over two years out from this Jeopardy challenge, and no one's, no one's coming out and saying, we can do that. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't I don't think it's that they don't, that they wouldn't, that they could, right? I mean, the data is all, the data that Jeopardy questions are, that we use are there. Someone could try to solve this problem and say we're just as good at IBM, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, so I don't see any any competitors al along this uh, this line. Um, I don't see them emerging anytime soon. Okay, I have to see some more Google questions coming in here. Uh, is the asynchronous scale-out capability of creating many new instances of components native to UEMA or does it require interaction with some sort of cluster process node management system? So it's a complex question, I guess. So, um, right. So what UEMA provides is these um, deploy. Basically, you declaratively to say how you want the system deployed. It basically. A description of a, deploying a process, right? So here's here's a process I want to deploy. It has these components in it, and then how how the communication is done between them. So communication is by asynchronous messaging. So it uses a a broker to pass messages between components. So we're using the Apache ActiveMQ broker. I probably should have mentioned that on the open source question. So Apache Active ActiveMQ asynchronous messaging is underlying how the the data is being sent from one node to the other. Um, being able to automatically deploy the process is using another an, another piece of technology that's also been delivered to UEMA. It's, the acronym for it is DUC, Distributed UEMA Computing Cluster. That's a more recent thing that we um, we are just more recently got into shape shape enough to share. But this is also something that is a cluster management thing that's part of UEMA and available from the Apache project that lets you. You register all your nodes with it, and then when you want to deploy the services, you talk to the server, and it goes and, and launches your services for you. So all that basically now is available as part of the Apache UEMA project. Thank you. Okay, we've got time for one more question. I think I, in our preparation, you – here's the question. Can you share one or two major dead ends in your attempt? And in doing so, you took the opportunity to – uh, float some question, Jeopardy questions, and the answer, rather humorous question, answers that um, Watson replied. So this will be right. our last question. Right. I think you were you were asking me if Watson has a sense of humor. Um, I think um, you know we were we worked together in this big lab, um, and every once in a while someone would just break out laughing, and everyone would be like, "What? What did you find?" Because we're all looking at questions, you know, answers produced by Watson. And some are just you know, happened to be funny. So we collected a bunch of them. So I had some examples I was sharing with Will, Will earlier. So I think one of the ones he liked was, uh, so the category is food for thought. And this question came from a few years back is, the Postal Service says not to mail meat from this animal to soldiers in Iraq. And Watson, for some reason, answered reindeer. I I don't know. I mean, we must have looked into it at the time, but you know, I, I can't tell you now even what that has anything to do with that. But it must have been something. So um, some of these are very low confidence. Remember, Watson, Watson knows that it's not right, so I wouldn't buzz in. But sometimes that's the best thing it can come up with, like amongst all of the low confidence answers. So it's probably a bad idea to mail reindeer meat, but um, I don't know. And uh, if I have time, if I have time for one more, no. Oh, one more, yes, please. So one more that I that I like is the question about the Denmark Strait separates these two islands by about 200 miles, and Watson's answer was Greenland and Taiwan, which are about as far apart as you can get instead of being 200 miles apart. What I like about this is that those are both islands separated by about 200 miles from something else, 
but not from each other. So you can kind of imagine in the, the unstructured language text that it, how it might get confused, um, but it's just way off. It's like as far off geographically as you could possibly get for that question, but it kind of gives you a, some insight into how we, how we can go wrong. So, uh, well, we, we really have run out of time. In closing, I'd like to once again thank you, Adam, for, for this uh, informative presentation and insightful answers. Uh, to uh, only uh, the tip of the iceberg of the questions. Our, our special thanks goes to our audience for taking the time. This was the largest attendance that we've had to date, and, uh, and your participation. With that, we go to the survey slide here. Oops, ah, didn't get to the survey slide here. Maybe the survey slide is actually there. Okay. So if you have a chance, please fill out this survey by clicking on the following URL, which should be showing on your screen right now or about now. That's not there. Let's try that. In any case, uh, this webinar will be available on demand at learning.acm.org in the next uh, few days. and. Um, don't forget to check out the ACM other great learning resources uh, on today's and tomorrow's most important topics in computing. Please check acm.org and learning.acm.org in the coming weeks for announcements on upcoming webinars. Uh, this is Will Trace saying hope you can join us next time, and if you have any ideas for future topics or speakers, please email them to learning at acm.org. Org. Thank you, and talk to you next time.